last speaker is actually uh, a surgeon I share my fellow with. Uh, Mark Bessler works out of Columbia University uh, at the New York Presbyterian Hospital Columbia campus. I work at the Cornell campus, so we have a, a few discussions uh, and we use the fellows as the intermediaries. Uh, Mark? Thanks, Alphonse, and that's more true than you would know. Um, do I can, am I on the Mac? How do I? I, I, I was. Are you on the Mac? Oh, wait, could you advance this slide? So uh, I've been asked to talk about single incision and endoluminal surgery. This is the uptown campus where Alphonse never comes. I have to go for meetings always downtown. That's not true either. Next slide, please. Um, and I have a lot of disclosures, all of which apply to everything I'm going to say today. So take it all with a grain of salt, please. Um, next slide, please. So surgery has advanced over the years. Um, there have been some major steps, and they've been pretty far apart. Um, antisepsis way back in the 1800s, blood banking, and these have all made great strides for us in surgery. None of them were really surgery until laparoscopy, so really the ability to do surgery. And now we're faced with, okay, can we do it better? We have the ability to do it, and can we do it better? So um, where are we going next? Laparoscopy is now, you know, in general surgery, 20 years old. 20 years in the history of surgery is not that long of a time, but things are accelerating um, dramatically. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about single incision surgery. I was going to talk a little bit about revisional and aluminal surgery. I'll probably blow through that quickly because of the time and because it's been touched upon by some others today. And so I'll talk a little bit about primary and aluminal operations. And these are really uh, single incision surgery and primary and aluminal, almost opposite end the ends of the spectrum as far as making incremental improvements for patients. I'll talk about that a little bit. But in single incision surgery, we're really trying to improve cosmesis and maybe outcome a little bit. It's sort of a, an incremental step. I think primary and aluminal surgery is going to be a total, and I hate to use the word, but a total frame shift into a different way of thinking and different way of approaching patients, really without surgery. Um, and I think the goal ultimately will be to afford, hopefully, effective therapeutic interventions to groups of patients who don't have it available to them, either because they're scared of surgery or because they're not heavy enough to qualify for the current procedures that have a little bit more risk. Right click this one, it's not loading. Okay. No. Right click. Ooh, that's bad. Can you put up the slideshow again? Slideshow. No. Presentation view. Loading the slideshow. All right, good. Yeah, this is, this is scary, trying to drive a mouse like by the, to get it up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next slide. Try it right, right click. Right click, that's what I got me in trouble. Not on a Mac. Not left click? Any click? Just, just advance the slides. There, just scroll. <laughs> scroll down, scroll down. All right, so um, one of the ways to look at this is that we're trying to eliminate scars for patients. Endoluminal surgery is certainly going to do that. There's no incisions at all. Single incision laparoscopy, we hide the scars, whether it's in the umbilicus or otherwise. And I'm not going to talk about notes, but that's another way to totally limit, eliminate visible scars. This is what we're talking about, gallbladder operation, big scar, laparoscopy, small scars, and uh, whether it's notes, which, which is what this is, or endoluminal surgery, ultimately no scars. So what is single surgery, incisional surgery? I, I happen to like that moniker. Uh, less is what people are using now, more spa, notes, uh, e-notes, it just too much to get my ha head around. So basically what we're trying to do is make a single incision, hide it away in the umbilicus. Whether you put in a specialized port or several different ports, um, we'll talk about a little bit. But the goal is to hopefully have cosmetic improvement. Whether there's going to be pain improvement, recovery improvement, I think that's uh, less likely, but certainly possible. And these are some of the devices that are used. Oh. OK. So. These are some of the devices that are used. Some of them are, are one and a half to two and a half or three centimeter incisions that you put into the <laughs> a fascial incision and give you access with several um, ports. Um, and what's nice about that is it, it gives you a lot of mobility, um, it keeps the pneumo well. We've also done this, as, as I showed on the previous slide, with just specific separate trocars put through the fascia, and the fascia is really your instrument. The problem with these other devices, they can cost three, four, five hundred dollars increasing the cost, and in today's day and age, cosmetic outcome improvement for cost may not fly long term. Maybe it will. Um, the instruments in the left upper corner and the right lower corner were um, flexible articulating either scope or, or hand instruments that will allow 
for um, articulation within the abdomen and therefore getting out of your own way. Because the biggest deal with single incision surgery and where, the, where it's frustrating is really hands clashing and some using longer instruments, some short and some long, trocars with small heads and articulation is the way around some of that. Hmm. So here's a video of, of a single incision um, laparoscopic hiatal hernia repair and, uh, and adjustable banding. Um, we're using separate uh, ports here because this was early in the days before there were single ports available. I still tend to do it this way a lot of the time. Um, these, these trocars are not ideal because of the, they each have their side ports on them. Um, what's interesting about these laparoscopic operations is you can see from the inside, they, they look pretty much like standard laparoscopy and that's the, the part that, that you don't see which you see in the right lower corner here on the outside with a lot of these things is what really makes this different. Um, you're in your own way the entire time. All your instruments, your retractor, everything, if you're doing true sills, are going through the same port. This is left upper quadrant, hiatal hernia there. We've done the same thing, trans umbilical, except you can't use the Nathanson retractor. You need to use some longer um, sort of retractor. We've used sutures that we place to sling up the, the liver. Um, some people have, have uh, stapled or sutured Penrose drains to the abdominal wall and a diaphragm to hold the liver up, but retraction is one of the issues because if you're going through a single incision, having the retractor as a rigid thing in your way is sort of a, a, a real pain. Here you can see the, v the view can be excellent. We're using an articulating um, scope to get out of the way of the other instruments, but you see all, all the devices are coming in line and that can be sort of um, frustrating to work with. Uh, we don't have articulating harmonic scalpel, although there are articulating hooks and um, and there will be other types of electrocautery devices that will articulate. Um, here, here in the right hand is an articulating instrument. You can see that's coming in from a different angle and it's very useful to have at least one articulating instrument. Using two articulating instruments in both, one in each hand can be really, really frustrating. But an articulating scope for the assistant and a, a single articulating instrument for the surgeon can be very, very helpful. Um, and here you can see the, the left cruise being mobilized as well. And this was a real hiatal hernia, so we're gonna do a posterior um, repair of the crura as, in addition to then putting a band on. Um, one of the other things I find is that, although I'm, I'm a fan anyway of, of the endosuture device, um, the endostitch, um, working in line like this is really, it's, it's almost perfect because you're going in and out, not side to side in order to do the suturing. Um, you don't have to worry about passing and resetting your needle all with the instruments in line. And so it's actually fairly helpful to suture if you know how to use that device. If you don't know how to use the device in standard laparoscopy, it's gonna be incredibly frustrating um, in single incision, but you'll, you'll see here ultimately that uh, we're gonna use the uh, endostitch device to suture the, the diaphragmatic uh, crura as well as ultimately the band in place. I guess we don't have a whole ton of time to show uh, a lot of video, so I'm gonna maybe um, skip past this once we start some of the, the suturing. But you can see here, you know, good visualization, again, because of the articulating scope, letting you look up into the hiatus and around things. Um, and there's the endo stitch um, in the left lower corner. And again, you notice that sometimes we're not working directly in the center of the screen. And that's again, because you're, you're fighting for the same space. And sometimes keeping the scope a little off center, allowing yourself to work in the corner of the screen. And these are some of the things you almost have to unlearn from standard laparoscopy. But you can see how easy doing the suturing is with this device coming in line. Um, you don't have to pass the suture side to side, which again gets involved in your hands knocking against other instruments, et cetera. Um, Inline um, suturing and, and tying knots is really very, very straightforward with this device. Not, not to be an advertisement, but it, it, it can be done without it. It's just a little bit more frustrating. I think I'm gonna skip this. And you can imagine just putting a band around and uh, from that point on. Here's single incision with all the instruments through the umbilicus for a sleep gastrectomy. Again, this was done before these other um, devices are available. And I, I show this just to, as a way that you don't have to increase the cost of these operations in order to do them single incision. It is more frustrating. There is a little bit more fighting when you have multiple heads of ports. And I do think it is a little easier with some of the specifically designed ports. The question is, is three, four, five hundred dollars as opposed to reusable ports really gonna fly? And here you can see articulation is, is again important. We have an articulating scope and articulating grasper to hold the stomach out of the way. And one of the interesting things we find is just like when we were doing notes, which I'm not gonna talk about, working from behind the stomach, which is one way to do a sleeve, is really actually very, very helpful. You don't have to worry as much about retraction of the liver and other things when you're using lifting of the stomach to give you the retraction. And doing a lot of this from behind allows you to see the short gastrics. It allows you good access to the left cruise of the diaphragm, which is sort of critical anyway to, to making sure the fundus is completely mobilized. And one of the ways you know this is being done, I hope, well, is that it looks like standard laparoscopy. If you're struggling, this isn't gonna look like standard laparoscopy. There's gonna be a lot of banging of things into each other. So again, different lengths of instruments, articulating instruments, 
um, are all sort of important. And, and it is, uh, you know, there's a learning curve to this, there is no doubt. And starting with gallbladders, appendixes, before you go on to more complicated surgery like this is certainly something I would recommend. And you don't have to go to single port right away. You can put two instruments in the umbilicus and one or two outside the umbilicus and move more and more towards everything in one place as, as you go along. I'm not sure a five millimeter left upper quadrant or right upper quadrant um, incision or really even flank incisions are better because patients aren't looking straight at them when they go in, looking in the mirror um, matters that much to patients. So a five millimeter incision kept out of the way to, to make this safe and easier um, and we don't hesitate sometimes to put in those additional um, incisions. And again, getting a look over the top of things with an articulating scope so as you go into the upper abdomen. Because in a patient that's obese with a very low umbilicus coming in with a straight scope, you're gonna have a very tangential view and some of these things are gonna be hard to see. So here you can see we're getting all the way up with a nice view, but we are in line. You know, your, your part of your view is being taken up by the shaft of your instrument. Uh, the articulating scope is helpful for that, not always necessary. An angled, say, 30 or 45 degree scope sometimes, if it's long enough, helps you get out of the way as well. Um, and here you can see the stapling, and that just is taken all the way up. And uh, the big stapler, you know, the 12 millimeter shaft of these things takes up a lot of real estate in the umbilicus. Um, so get as much done as you can and not have to go back after you put that big port in. Let's see if I take that. Is that right? Um, so now I'm going to sh shift to talk about endoluminal surgery. Um, endoluminal surgery has been around for a long time. Um, endoluminal surgery is sort of a, a frame shift for surgeons if you think about it because in the old days when you needed to biopsy something in the colon or take out a polyp, you had to open the colon in order to do it. Then came along flexible endoscopy and, you know, surgically we're removing polyps now. That used to be a real operation. ERCP, common bile duct exploration, totally replaced or almost totally replaced. Um, stenting has replaced, you know, um, reoperation on patients for, for leaks, maybe not in sleep gastrectomy, although I think that is appropriate. Um, Antonio and I can talk about that later. And pseudocyst drainage. I mean, we used to do cyst gastrostomy. I'm not even doing laparoscopic cyst gastrostomies anymore because it's being done endoscopically. They'll put, you know, four or five stents across the wall of the stomach. So now we're talking about how to do endoluminal surgery um, to, for, for diseases that, that are typically surgery that require more tissue manipulation than just pinching or making a hole in something, but reconstructing. I put up the stuff about GERD only to prove that this is going to be iterative. Um, GERD in the past, Streta, Endosynch, Gatekeeper, NDO, Plicator, they all sort of didn't work. Well, maybe NDO worked. I'll show you a little data on that. Now we've got esophix, metagus, and other things coming along. And, and we're more and more mimicking what we did in surgery. And as we more and more mimic what we did in surgery, I think we're going to have more success. The, the, es uh, the esophix results, which is now like, you know, the third, fourth generation of, of anti-reflux procedures showing 80% getting off meds and 50% normalization of acid exposure in the stomach. It's not as good as a Nissen, but it also isn't as big a deal as a Nissen. It has less side effects. We don't have data long term out on, on esophics, but look at NDO data out to 60 months. Um, percent of subjects that are off medications, 30% um, out to 60 months. Again, not as good as a Nissen, um, but still effective for, for a significant portion of patients out to five years. So we may have effective long term therapy coming along and things may even get better over time as this is iterated. Well, we're going to see the same thing in obesity. Some of the early revision obesity stuff, the Endosynth trial, Restore trial, a randomized blinded sham control trial. Uh, we don't have results published yet, but my understanding is that it didn't reach its endpoints. Um, I think that's because it was a very carefully done study. And a lot of the other things you see um, don't have control trials. It's registry data or, or just a series. And the placebo effect in weight loss is real. You can see 30% excess weight loss from a diet. And you, you do a procedure on a patient and tell them they had something done that's going to help them lose weight. And they're going to lose weight for a while, three to six months. By a year, I think that's gone. And if you have well-controlled results out to a year that show a difference, then I think you have a real difference. The early data on endosynth, this is just eight patients. There's, there's again, a, a control trial. Um, suggested that you could reduce the diameter from 10 millimeters significantly um, down in most patients. Um, the average um, P BMI after a reduction of their weight was, was 37 for a 23% excess weight loss. That's in just eight patients. Um, and you can see you get the stoma down from, from what's over two centimeters to down to less than one centimeter. Mean excess weight loss in, in, the, in this study was 14%. I want you to pay attention to that number, 14%. That's 14% of the current excess weight loss for the patient. Um, again, that's what you get with diets. Um, how long does that last? I don't think we really know. Stoma fix, this instead of putting sutures in there, puts these T-tags. I don't think you actually get them to the stoma. This is really um, sort of, I call them speed bumps that you put into the pouch along the way to the stoma. It's really pouch reduction and maybe narrowing uh, above the stoma. 
Um, results not been published. Uh, Dr. McCommy gave me these from Ohio State, and at 16 weeks, 23 pounds. Again, this is in a small number, 30 patients. And whether this is um, going to be long term, we have no idea. Um, the company is just um, t underway in a in a controlled trial, and I have a feeling in a controlled trial we're going to see a lot of these results fall away. By a year, I don't think we're going to be seeing differences between uh, treatment and control, unfortunately. That doesn't mean we can't iterate to get this better and better. I think we will. Um, this is another uh, device. What's interesting about this one, it's, it's the uh, USGI's uh, G-Prox device, which puts out these little baskets that are attached with sutures and then can be stented together. You see one of the baskets in the right lower corner coming out there, and in the animation on the left side, um, you can see how, how that's being done. And then these two baskets of, of mesh get cinched together, plicating or pleating the tissue. The amazing thing about this is I never predicted that these things were going to be present in the stomach a year later. Well, all right, all right, I get it. Um, Next slide, I can't get it to go, um, shows a year later, these things are still in the stomach. You see the one in the right lower corner, that one's um, not well cinched down perhaps, but the one in the left upper corner, the mesh is embedded and implanted in, in the um, mucosa there. And these things are probably going to last, amazingly enough, and if you keep foreign material that causes scarring in there, maybe this will have better results. But 18% excess weight loss at six months, same as they saw in the early trials with, with the um, endosynch and ultimately not... Uh, not in the control trial. I cannot advance these slides anymore. Okay, so primary obesity, I'll, I guess I'll have to fly through some of this stuff. Um, Dr. Fogel pr um, published a paper looking at endosynch um, plication of the stomach. There's a prospective randomized sham control trial of TOGA, um, and the rest of this stuff is either early human experience and mostly outside the U.S. I still cannot. Um, this is Dr. Fogel's procedure modified called the trim procedure, basically taking the front and back walls of the stomach using the endosynch device to suction acquire the front wall and suture it to the back wall, um, and that's done in multiple places along the stomach. These sutures get cinched down, and the, nice, the new device doesn't have to be taken out and replaced each time you place a suture. You pass the scope once, and you can place the sutures over and over again. Beautiful thing about that is it's a standard scope. It can go down under conscious sedation or not needing general anesthesia. So imagine a bariatric procedure that can be done under conscious sedation. Patients have no incisions, basically back to work the next day as if they had an endoscopy. And you can see here multiple plications. You're basically quilting the front and back wall of the stomach together. If this really works, and he did it for 64 patients, look at the results. They're, I, I call them incredible, um, hyphen between the in and the credible. But um, almost 80% almost weight loss, excess weight loss in the, in the low BMI patients and 60% weight loss in, in the whole group, um, that's gastric bypass. And it's hard for me to imagine that a a purely restrictive procedure is going to give you gastric bypass results, and ultimately that won't hold up. But if you could get 30% excess, excess weight loss sustained for a few years, this will be a, a true revolution. The TOGA stapler is something that I was an, I am an investigator in their clinical um, trial in the U.S. I'm going to go through this quickly, but here's two videos in the left showing you an animation and the right showing it actually happening. The stapler comes down the esophagus opens up in the stomach. This sail goes up to separate the front and back walls of the stomach, which then are sucked into the stapler. The sail's pushed out of the way. That's important. And then you staple the front and the back walls of the stomach together. You do this twice, making about a seven centimeter long um, tube, and they have a restrictor stapler that goes down to restrict the outlet at the bottom. I don't know how important that is, but you can see on upper GI here in the right side that you basically have a nice tube at the top of the stomach. You can see fundus up top. It's not a leak. It's fundus of the stomach separated from that, that tube. And this is the weight loss um, out to 12 months, 46% excess weight loss, which is as good as other restrictive procedures. Um, will this hold up in sham control trials? We will have to see. And this is an endoluminal um, stent sleeve. It's placed by uh, GI Dynamics. You go down with a scope, under fluoro, you pass this capsule into the duodenum. The capsule pushes out uh, this sleeve, and then the, the stent is released in the duodenum to hold the sleeve in place. I have no experience except in animals placing this, but in South America, there's guys that have placed hundreds of these already. Um, and you can actually add restriction to this by taking a, a, a diaphragm and putting it within that stent to limit the uh, size of particles that can go through. And uh, it's easily removed. You go in with a scope. There's a suture at the top of that um, stent. You grab the suture, pull on the suture, it collapses the stent, and you pull it out. And actually, these have to be removed right now at about six months because uh, migration starts to increase at about that time. But here you're getting a bypass effect, sort of. You're bypassing the duodenum, as, as um, Ricardo was talking about earlier. I think I skipped the results slide on that. Nope. Okay. Well, in summary, I think that uh, single incision surgery is a step towards making cosmesis better. Whether it's going to be pain and recovery remains to be seen. Um, 
but endoluminal surgery is really uh, has a chance to, to totally revolutionize this. We shouldn't give it up to the gastroenterologists. Um, keep keep up it for to, you know not only for ourselves but in collaboration with them. And uh, hopefully, he's going to offer procedures that are effective to a whole lot of people that don't have them available now. Thanks, Mark.